All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, wherever you are, thank you for joining us for another edition of our monthly Trimble Business Center Power Hours. Uh, today, we will be talking about MX9 mobile mapping workflows in TBC. I am your um, vocal short host, Joe Blecka. Um, I will not be doing much of the pre uh, presenting to your benefit today. Um, we have Ray Wu with us um, to do the bulk of the presentation. And Ray, if, can you, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Joe. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray. I have been sitting in the TBC team for uh, about half a year now. Um, today, I will help Joe to present the MX9 workflow in TBC. Hope you'll like it. Yeah, and thank you. Ray's done a great job preparing this, and we should have a good show for you. Um, just a, a real quick um, bit of intro. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to type them into the questions window um, where they can kind of strategically fall within the content of Ray's presentation. Uh, I can ask, and if we don't have time for you or if it's something kind of one-off, um, we'll reach you uh, offline after the fact. So please use that question window um uh, to to your advantage <clears throat> all right what we're going to be um, talking about today is an introduction to the mobile mapping mx9 solution um, so the mx9 hardware has um, been around for about a year now um, it's a new uh, mobile mapping uh, imagery and uh, laser platform um, but what today's all about is that that last word there solution um, and where the MX-9 in the TBC workflow kind of fits. Um, Ray is going to take us through a uh, TBC version 501 demonstration. Um, if you're keeping score at home, um, you would note that uh, the latest version of TBC is version 5.00. Um, we released a couple weeks ago version 501 with some very specific enhancements and bug fixes to the mobile mapping and MX-9 workflows. Um, that that uh, release is public. However, with still a small segment of our overall TBC market, um, we thought it best to um, still keep the 501 um, release not, not available like on the, on the download page or anything. But if you are into mobile mapping or if you're using these mobile, mobile systems, um, reach out to your Trimble rep or your uh, local distribution partner, and we can get you this download. It is it is a public download. If you need it, we can make it available to you. Um, those functionalities in 501 will be released in the uh, future, you know, broad public uh, release here, um, likely in quarter two of 2019. Uh, Ray is going to take us through some TBC best practices and uh, with mobile mapping, and then I will get back on and talk about resources, and hopefully we've um, got you interested enough to take some uh, further next steps, learn more about TBC and our mobile mapping solutions. All right, introduction. So here's just a quick overview of what the uh, Trimble mobile mapping uh, platform on the hardware side offerings are. We've got the MX-9, the MX-2, and the MX-7. Um, these three hardware units do address various market segments with um, specific features and components of these systems. So we'll be talking mostly about the MX-9, uh, or completely about the MX-9 today. Um, that's really targeting large survey projects um, for survey design engineering um, and corridor uh, type of data collection that can then be used um, for planning, design, as-built information, um, utility mapping, uh, all sorts of things with, you know, the dual uh, um, uh, hardware feature of sensors and uh, images, cameras as well. Uh, the MX-2 is a laser-based only system for smaller survey projects, um, complex areas, survey and mapping grade. And the MX-7 um, is really uh, an image-based system that's for asset management, documentation, uh, really for like a GIS feature collection, inventory, maintenance uh, uh, type of op operation, um, also for digital imaging logs. 
So where this fits in for today is the uh, MX-9. Um, so our mantra here in TVC, if you're new, is uh, field to finish uh, office software. So being able to take the data from the MX-9, um, do your adjustments and processing, registration or, or uh, um, uh, ground control point work, uh, adjust and create a point cloud and uh, leverage those images and point clouds then to create your deliverables, um, really providing the value of one software field to finish workflow with um, MX-9 and TVC. Uh, how we accomplish this is two new modules specifically for the MX-9, the TVC mobile mapping module and then the TVC mobile mapping uh, MX-9 laser correction module. This was uh, released in at the end of 2018. And then there's that patch there I just mentioned um, a couple weeks ago, we released version 501. Um, and what this is really targeting and who we're really targeting here, um, focusing on survey ser service providers within TVC. Um, so seamless data integration with other survey sensors. Um, the idea and the value uh, that TVC brings is that it can be that one uh, one-stop software package for your survey and construction needs. Um, data is data in TVC. So once you get the uh, adjustment, uh, the adjusted point cloud and images, you can then do whatever you want with it within TVC, creating surfaces, creating corridor models, um, being able to create points, uh, draft some line work, um, really flow into the rest of, of uh, the kind of more traditional uh, survey and mapping workflows and construction workflows that are supported in TVC. Um, we hope to use the TVC environment to onboard and drive more mobile mapping users. If it's, a, if it's something that they're already using um, for their survey workflow, for their you know, GNSS or total station workflow, um, we're getting into more and more uh, terrestrial laser scanning as well. Um, this is really, TVC is, is really positioning as the hub for all of your survey data. And we're getting mobile mapping into that equation as well. So the workflow, um, what this looks like, and this is a very, very high level, uh, good point to um, not necessarily take a screenshot here or anything, but good point for me to note that um, what this presentation shares and then the data sets that uh, Ray will be going over today um, will be made available to you in the follow-up uh, um, uh, recording notification email. So uh, don't have to scribble madly here to get some of this down. Uh, we will make all of this available to you um, publicly here in, in a day or so after, after the, uh, the webinar concludes. Um, so you can see that just a, a real quick overview of what's going on and the solution um, of MX-9 and TVC, where you collect data in the field with uh, TMI field software, um, post-process the trajectory in post-pack, bring that corrected trajectory and the data into TVC and leveraging the mobile mapping and the laser correction modules, uh, apply that SBET, compute the MTA, do the point cloud colorization, do the point cloud registration, and then you're off to the races with the other TVC point cloud functionality, with the TVC drafting functionality, surface tools, um, and, and anything else from there. Um, and then where that data can live, well, sure, it can live in TBC, but we also offer uh, the TMX for content um, asset and publisher uh, to manage that data, or um, prevalent third-party applications, TopoDot, TerraSolid, or an export to Autodesk, Bentley, Esri, the, kind of the big three of our um, uh, the third parties. Um, to note, in version 501, we did add a specific uh, topo dot export for point clouds and um, uh, the images. So that was one of the big new feature ads in version 501. Didn't want to wait, wanted to get that out to everybody here as soon as possible. So in 501, there is an easy way now to get your MX-9 data into topo dot. All right, I am sick of talking. We will um, keep the questions going uh, if you want, and I'll turn over to Ray. Um, while Ray is doing this demo, I want you to think, and please feel free to contribute to the questions. Um, we wanna know if you've done mobile mapping work in the past or are currently doing it, 
And what applications have you have you used mobile mapping for if you have? Or if you're interested here, if you're you're attendee saying, hey, Trimble's got this MX9 solution in TBC, um, what applications would you do with it? Um, so think about those moving forward. There is a chance there at the end after the webinar um, to collect some feedback from you, but happy to hear your thoughts there. And uh, with that, I will stop talking and send it over to Ray. Thank you, Joe. Um, without further talking, um, I will just jump into Trimble Business Center directly. Uh, if you have downloaded TBC 5.0, then this UI won't look uh, unfamiliar to you. So basically, I will uh, follow the same TBC routine to create a new project. For me, the blank template will work for now. If you are already familiar with the MX9 data project uh, a structure, you will know that uh, every time when you download the uh, data from the field SSD drives, you will get uh, some of these camera folders, depends on which cameras you enabled in the field. You will get two laser folders to host the uh, point clouds or the scans from MX9. And also you will get some raw positioning information in this pause underscore one folder where you can drag and drop these files into post pack and uh, get the trajectory pro post processed. And the post pack result can be saved in the same folder for um, easier data management. And the most important thing in this folder is the SBAT file. And also uh, the MXDB is what we are going to drag and drop into TBC, which serves as a uh, library card. Um, once we drag and drop this MXDB or a uh, similar thing to the JXL, TBC will know where to find the SBAT file, the uh, scans file, and the camera files. So here I'm just going to drag and drop the MXDB file into TBC. Oh, I already noticed a an, an, uh, mistake I make, but uh, actually if you go to the mobile mapping module, the first thing you should do is to change the coordinate system, which will also be talked about in the later uh, best practice sessions. Um, right now it's okay, I can still change the coordinate system now to the proper coordinate system I want to use later this data was collected in Colorado, Westminster area, so I'm going to choose the proper projection. And now the trajectory will sit in the correct position. And it's showing this medium green color because I already applied an SBAT file to this trajectory. If I go to the Project Explorer and right click this trajectory and choose properties, you should be able to see which SBAT file it's trying to use. In my MX9 data folder, I already have several SBAT files created because of the adjustment I did before. So TBC always try to find the latest one available in your folder. If you want to change it to a different one, you could come back to your data folder and choose the correct one. Now we're using an older SBAT file instead. So with the trajectory in, um, you will see first the medium green color to represent the whole mission, meaning your vehicle probably started somewhere here for the uh, 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 initialization, as you can see the typical figure eight driving style. And then we drove all the way down to this road and then back. But all the data are kind of managed by the runs instead of the trajectory itself. If I uh, expand the mobile mapping node and to see all uh, both runs in this mission, I can also toggle the trajectory to see where the actual data are sitting in. For example, here for run zero, we're driving down this road and all these dots 
are representing the camera positions where the panoramic images or the side camera images are taken. Same thing for run one, we can toggle the trajectory and notice that it's kind of visiting the same road, but on the other direction. So now we have the trajectory in, we can start to generate the point cloud. How to do that? You, you notice that in the mobile mapping tab, we're kind of arranging all the item uh, icons following the natural workflow. So once we change the coordinate system and bring in the trajectory, the next natural thing to do is to either highlight a run or a mission and then choose generate scans. The most important thing in this uh, window is the process MTA. Uh, using the MTA correction module in TBC, we will be able to correct uh, any unnecessary noises in the MX9 data uh, point cloud. Um, a lot of times, if we don't run this uh, multiple time around module, uh, you will start to notice maybe some uh, buildings showing up in the middle of a highway because they are kind of giving us a, um, a, a wrong or a fake return. But uh, by just the checking this simple box, uh, TBC will handle it and remove any unnecessary noise because of that. And then you can see both runs listed here. If you also want to further check what kind of data are sitting in each run, you will be able to uh, click on the run and see the, all the information over here. And hit next. The same SBAT file will be listed again here but you have a chance to browse to a different one if you want to. I will leave the colorization to the end because uh, usually um, colorization is mainly for visualize visualization purposes, but here uh, all the things we need to do is to click the process button. Since this is, hey, uh, Ray. go ahead. Can I, Ray, can I interrupt you for a second? So sure. I'm new to, um, the mobile mapping workflows. Could you explain to me what an SBAT file is? Sure. Yeah. So the SBAT file is the smooth, the best estimated trajectory generated by Postpack software. Uh, basically, in the Postpack, uh, we will bring in all the raw uh, GNSS positions and also the IMU uh, orientations from the field. And the Postpack will use this. Um, uh, infusion method to uh, post-process the trajectory and give us this out file where all the new GNSS information and orientation will be adjusted and smoothed out. So using this aspect, you should expect to see a more accurate trajectory. Usually um, if, in, uh, if you're uh, kind of doing your job in a GNSS friendly environment, you should expect to see a centimeter level uh, accuracy in your tra trajectory instead of um, in the field directly, your trajectory is usually meters away. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. So the next thing to do is to hit the process button and the TBC will start generating the scans uh, as well as uh, applying the MTA module to all the point clouds. This can take a few minutes for this four kilometer long run. So I'm going to cancel here and just to show you a pre post processed result. Here we go. We now have the point cloud generated for both run zero and run one. Uh, if you're familiar with, with TBC, the view filter manager is always a good helper to have, uh, especially when you're working with point cloud. So as you can see here in the view filter manager, we have two scans generated for run zero and two scans for run one. And of course, you can use the same point uh, cloud rendering methods in the mobile mapping tab to show the scan colors or to use grayscale intensity or color-coded intensity to check the result. Of course, you can also turn on the 3D view 
to see more details. But now, for me, the most important thing is I want to import the ground control points and start to further tune the, um, the point cloud. How do I do that? I already have some ground control points created or surveyed thanks to Skylar on this po uh, project and, and Nick as well. And here it's in a CSV format. And all I need to do is to, oh, sorry, not checkpoints target. I will just drag and drop this CSV into TBC. Since it's a T, uh, CSV format that TBC can see some similarity with the predefined definition, the import format editor will, pops up, will pop up. And here, it's waiting for my further input of how I want to import this CSV. So I am going to pick the point ID Easting, northing, elevation, code uh, definition, and I'm going to uh, continue using the control quality for all the points. I can hit next and make sure all the uh, definitions are properly defined. Hit next again and hit import. Now we get six points uh, imported for this run. And you can already see they are kind of already sitting on the correct points. But uh, right now, they are still a little bit off. For example, for point 1035, it should be at the corner of this pavement marking, but it's still a few centimeters off. So that's exactly why we want to use ground control points to further adjust the point cloud. So back in the Project Explorer, I will start to register run one because in this run, it covers all six points. If I just turn off all the run one uh, point cloud and turn on the run zero, as you can see, run zero, unfortunately, doesn't cover the starting point and, and uh, the end point as well. Hey, Ray, does that order that you do the registration in matter? Um, not necessarily. Basically, here, my rule of thumb would be I will try to pick a run that covers most ground control points from beginning to end, and also uh, check the quality of this registration first. Then, once I'm satisfied with the quality of this run registration, I will use it as a reference run and then start to re uh, register other runs later. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have run one picked from the Project Explorer. And you can also notice now the register a run button is highlighted or uh, enabled. We can only register one run at a time. And once I pick the run one and choose register a run, you will notice the proper, uh, uh, the, the corresponding scans from this run is also turned on. And then the next thing to do is to add ground control points to this command. Before I do that, I will highlight all these points and put them into a different layer called ground control points. Now I will add all these selections to my command pane. And I can start to zoom in a little bit. And once I'm ready to start picking the scan points for each point, all I need to do is to click on the point, and TBC will recenter to that proper point. Since this ground control point is so close to the actual target, I now can turn off this layer so I can observe the point cloud easier. I will pick this point either from the plan view or more recommended 3D view so that I can rotate around a little bit to make sure this point is sitting on the ground level on the right spot. Go to the next point. If you forget where your ground control point should be, turn on and off the layer. 
Here, I'm going to go through this workflow quickly because we only have one hour to cover everything. There we go. For this one, I remember it's on this point. And for this one, In this specific data set, we're using natural targets, such as the pavement markings, to uh, survey the ground control points. But in your project, depends on the requirement, you can use different target types, which we will talk about in the uh, best practice session. So, uh, yeah, and assuming... Ray, we've gotten a couple of, Go sorry, we've gotten a couple of questions around um, GCP distribution and how, f how frequently or where they should be placed. Um, mm -hmm. We do cover that in the general best practices. Um, it is a tricky question to answer though, depending on the data set and um, you know, the quality of the GNSS and um, the, the environment that you're in. So we will cover that in, uh, uh, in the best practices section here in a, in a few minutes. Yep. Um, so yeah, so here uh, I am just trying to um, click uh, six points very quickly. So, uh, once I finish all the ground control points picking, I can click Compute button. And this should only take a few seconds to compute the whole new trajectory for me. Notice that once I'm, uh, uh, the, the, the thing uh, TBC is doing when I click the Compute button is only creating a new SBAT file, not necessarily the point cloud yet. Um, once we click compute, a new SBAT file is created, then we will apply it. So this new SBAT file will be imported in your project, just in case that you did something wrong and you hit the compute button, but you actually don't want to use it. Once the new SBAT file is applied to, the, your, uh, to your project, you can then update your scans to create the new point cloud. It should be finished in a few seconds. Now the compute is done. And the first thing you will notice is that uh, instead of seeing some elevation residuals and northing easting residuals in the registration command pane, now they all show uh, a zero number, meaning that TBC has tried to adjust all the point uh, uh, the trajectory to where they are supposed to be. And in the 3D view, you can have a more vivid view where uh, remember the medium green color comes from our current SBAT file. And then this baby blue colored uh, trajectory is the new SBAT generated by doing this registra registration. Right now, like I said, it's not applied to this project yet, but once I hit apply, this new baby blue trajectory will become the medium green one, meaning that right now, if I look at the property of this mission, we now get a new SBAT file called SBAT registered 00001.out. Okay. So that's the procedure of registering your uh, trajectory or your scans to some ground control points. Of course, it's not finished yet. The next thing to do is to highlight your run or mission again, and then click update scans. It's a very similar window as we have in the generate scans window. The only difference is now uh, we already applied MTA modules to all the point cloud. We don't need to apply it again. Instead, all I need to do is to pick the run I want to update, hit next. It's looking at the new SBAT file. And again, just to hit process, and TBC will create the new point cloud based on it. 
this can take another a few minutes. So I will just jump into a different project to show you the result. So first the thing I want to show you is again in the view filter manager, as you can see, instead of removing the raw uh, scans from run one, PVC actually keep a copy of it. At the same time, it will generate a new set of scans so that even if now you want to roll back to the old scans for some reason, uh, you don't need to recompute everything from scratch. Instead, you can just remove the scans you don't want to from the Project Explorer scans note. For example, if now I am not happy with the new ones, I can right click on this uh, scan and choose delete. But now I'm going to show you the result with the registered uh, point cloud. So I already create some um, cutting plane view along this trajectory so that we can easily see where these points are and uh, where the point, how the point cloud is matching with the uh, ground control points. So here, if I just go to the point clouds tab and open the cutting plane view, I already have a plane predefined, but if you are not familiar with the cutting plane, uh, uh, workflow of course next month we're going to have another power hour on top of it but here is a quick overview you can create a new pro uh, plane give it some name and in this specific case i already created a linear path along this run so i can create planes from the linear path and then under the subplanes mode i can come back to the plan view and i can look at these ground control points and add specific uh, uh stations at these positions at and i'll go to the next point which is here Hey, Ray, um, mm -hmm. question, and, and I don't know if you, if you know this about this data set, um, do you know the rate of collection that this data uh, was uh, collected at in the field? Um, I only remember the, uh, the frequency of the scanning is uh, 1 million points per second. And okay. for the camera, I think we're kind of using a three feet baseline between cameras. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so basically the highest frequency as we can have in the field. There we go. We now have a new cutting plane created and it's going to give us some slides at all these uh, positions. Close. And go back to the 3D view. So now, if I'm going to use this cutting new cutting plane definition and jump around, oh, sorry. Hey, Ray, the collection rate is it? It's one million per laser head, correct? Yeah, correct. Was this, was this just the, using a single laser? Was it double? Was it both of them? This one is using both both laser scans. Okay. Yeah. So the max rate could be, could be two million. Correct. Yes. Oh, sorry. Right. Thank you. No worries. Here I will change the cutting plane thickness a little bit so that we can see a very thin slice around each point. So now you can see before if I turn on the old point cloud, there are kind of floating in the air on top of the point uh, ground control point. But after the registration, now the point cloud matches perfectly with all our ground control points. 
and I will use the slider to go through all the points just to, to quickly show you the result. And there. If you're happy with this registration result, uh, like I am right now, I will start to use this run as my reference and add some more uh, tie points so that I can use both my ground control points and these tie points to register my run zero, which is kind of overlapping on the same road. How do I do tie points? I will give you a quick example. So the, the, the goal of having more tie points is that uh, if your ground control points are not that densely distributed along the whole uh, run, you can eventually have some of these common points you can see in both runs and only use them for controlling the Z axis accuracy. In this case, if I go to the cat function and say create a point, instead of be very accurate on where that point is, I can probably say, um, since I'm going to only use this point for Z axis adjustment, I will change the quality to mapping for easting northing, but for elevation, I will keep it as control so that when I'm adding these points to my uh, project, for example, uh, here I will say I want to add a point um, at the at the end of this stripe. And I don't have to be very accurate on where this point will be because as long as I can kind of pick a, a nearby point in run zero, then this is a qualified control uh, type point. As you can see here, I created a point and I created a little bit more along the road. And once I have these ground, uh, tie points, what I can do is to observe them from my run zero to make sure they are visible in this run as well. So let me jump to a different one maybe, just to show you what it looks like. In this case, I'm just depicting the tip of this corner point, but they don't necessarily be that accurate. Now I have all the tie points and ground control points, um, and I'm happy with run one. I will start to work on run zero. So again, choose run zero from your project explorer, and then go to mobile mapping, register a run. This time, I will have more points to add to my list. The ground control points will still contribute to X, Y, and the Z axis. But as you can see, since this is how I uh, created my tie points, all the tie points will only contribute to the Z axis. But how do you choose the points in the point cloud it is basically the same. You can just come to a close by position and then click on the uh, point cloud to pick this point. I'm not going to continue the same workflow because of the time, um, is, but um, basically you can see this is the same workflow. And once I add all these points to my run zero registration, I will hit compute. Another new SBAT file will be created and I will click apply. And then eventually in um, the update scans, I will use that new SBAT file to update my scans for run zero. Time to show you the result. Now you can see run zero are registered at, as well, and it's using a new registered 0002 SBAT file. And at the same time, this newest SBAT file is applied to the whole project as well. Now, if we go back to the cutting plane view to further check the uh, uh, quality of these two registrations. Oops. 
expand it a little bit. I actually added a few more uh, planes uh, uh, sitting on these tie points. So if I now go back to the first station and make sure I have run zero and run one turn on at the same time. For the first point, you only see green color because remember run zero doesn't cover this point. But since we start to move in, you will start to see both colors showing. The red color comes from run zero and the green color comes from run one. And you can see they are kind of matching very well on these points. Basically, that's the registration workflow for MX9. If you have uh, more than one runs covering the same road, you can always register one of these runs um, and carefully check its quality. And once you're happy with that run registration, use it as a reference and then start to add more tie points between that run and other runs and register other runs accordingly. Once you so, Ray, have... the re reference runs, uh, I've got a question yeah. here. Um, the reference runs kind of build on each other, right? So you start with one and then you add um, additional runs to it. So it is possible to have multiple runs as reference. You just need to build them out, um, you know, kind of additive one at a time, correct? Or add one at a time? Correct. Um, actually, we don't really distinguish which run is the reference run. Um, so the user can basically decide which run they want to use as a reference. Um, being a reference run basically means you will pick some tie points from that run. But overall, it's, a sa it's the same run as other runs are. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So now if I am happy with these two registration results and uh, I don't need to have the uh, raw point cloud anymore sitting in my project, like I mentioned before, I can now come into the project explorer and the delete all the, all the original runs from here. But right now, I'm just going to keep it as it is. Um, and the next thing I definitely want to show you is the um, export options. Um, once we finish the registration of the point clouds, um, if you want to, you can choose to export the MX9 data sets to third-party platforms such as Topodot and such as TMX. How do we do that? You can just go to the regular export pane and we have a mobile mapping uh, tab showing up here. Some of them are only working with MX7, but we do have two exporters created for MX9. And if I um, now choose the whole mission from the um, uh, plan view or from the project explorer or a run, then you can see one data is selected. And in the settings, I can choose what kind of data I want to export. Uh, if you are mostly interested in the panoramic camera views or the scans, you can turn no for the side camera and backward camera. And then you can define a file name. In this case, it's more of a folder name so that uh, all the files will be saved in this TBC project folder under this folder. So I will give you a quick overview of what they looks like. Under this folder, I have an export for run zero to the TMX format. I have a trajectory file created. I have a panorama camera views exported, uh, side cameras, which are planner one and two. And then I have all the point clouds saved in the LAS 1.2 format. Similar thing happens if I click MX9 export to Topodot, where Topodot 
is expecting some cubic kind of image, image formats. So if I just uh, uh, pick all the yes for all the pictures and LAS, then I should expect to see this kind of folder under which we have the image projects. They have some special calibration files. And under each folder, you will see the panoramic views are now in the cubic formats. And of course, the LAS file is also generated and exported. If you just want to export all the point cloud, of course, you can always come to the point cloud tab and choose all the regular or standard uh, industry standard formats from here. Next thing I want to do is to colorize the point cloud. Um, because we only have one hour to go, I don't have time to go through the whole procedure. But basically, you pick the run and you go to mobile mapping and in the update scans button uh, 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 command, you can choose to check the colorize points button and you can choose to apply a vehicle mask. What does a vehicle mask look like? Here I have some masks created. Basically, once you uh, click generate button, TBC will generate all these PGM files for you. And if you open one of each, they are the similar cubic images you saw in the topo.export. The only difference is this one is uh, a, gray, a gray color only. And um, remember, in this area, you should see um, the MX9 laser scanners. But in this case, I will be able to paint this area with black color so that when we are colorizing the point cloud, your scan uh, uh, hats will not always show in your point cloud. And basically, that's the only difference uh, if you want to colorize your point cloud. I'm not going to do it. Now we have a very good quality point cloud to work with. I'm going to show you some more uh, TBC functions related to how we can utilize the point cloud. And the first thing uh, you want to do is to classify the regions. By clicking just one button, you can extract everything and uh, give different regions to this point cloud. And this can take a while since we are looking at a overall four kilometer long run, which is about um, a few thousand feet. So I'm not going to do it in real time. Instead, I will show you the classified result as well as in this project, I have some deliverables created so you can see how the MX-9 could work with your regular workflow. And this is one of the exciting things about this workflow is, and I touched on it a little earlier, is you know, data is data in TBC. So um, the classification routine that, that Ray's showing is the same um, with any other kind of point cloud. You can bring your LAS file in from wherever you got it from and run the same thing, and, and these, these uh, other steps that uh, Ray's gonna show, um, same thing, get your data into TBC and, and the tools can be used. Yeah, just like uh, Joe is saying, I'm going to show you how to extract some features and also touch a little bit on the uh, a corridor kind of workflow and then generate some deliverables so that the point cloud is not just something you can frame and uh, hang on your wall. Instead, you can really extract information from it. So first thing first, here you can see the classified result on this uh, point cloud. We have buildings, we have some trees, we have the ground uh, instead of the very noisy um, uh, streets nearby. And we also have the poles and signs uh, extracted. I am going to start with pose and signs and show you um, the point extraction uh, workflow. So here, the first thing I want to do is to just draw a small rectangle area around this. And only show this small area. Okay, 
and I will just keep this small area in. All right. So now we have a smaller area to work with for this demonstration. The next thing I want to do is to hit extract point feature icon to open the command. I will start with the poles, uh, actually the, uh, yeah, the pole extraction type. And if I want to extract this uh, street light, I can just quickly click on this point, hit enter, and TBC will extract this pole for me. Um, instead of just having the uh, position of this pole, it will also return the uh, diameter of this pole as well as the height of this pole. Now we got the result. The position of this pole will be sitting on the ground at the centroid of this pole structure. And all I need to do is to give it a pole, uh, point ID and put in the proper feature code. In this case, I will put in light pole. And then as you can see, the coordinate has already been extracted by TBC for me and the diameter and the height attributes will be mapped automatically with the correct numbers. So hit add. I didn't change anything, did I? Oh, probably because I didn't have this layer turned on. Not turn on the layer. Why? Let me close it. Hey Ray, is oh, the um, height attribute set up as a conditional in the FXL? Maybe. Sorry, know, what flag, question flag, again? It's flagging the pole height there. Um, if you hover over that red, yeah, there you oh, go. Oh, okay. There we go. You're right, yeah. So we have some uh, defined maximum and minimum values for each pole height. But if I here just fake a number in, you can see the symbol will also change accordingly. And now I should be able to and, add this pole. Okay, now I see. And that's, yeah. not, that's not a limitation of the software. That's a restriction that had been placed on the, um, the uh, feature attribute code in the um, feature definition manager. So there's not a, a universal maximum of 30 uh, anywhere in the software. That's that's a user imposed um, restriction with this, this feature lock. Correct, yeah. So now, as you can see, we have a poll created. For the signs, it's pretty much the same idea. Uh, I can just uh, choose sign as my extraction type and then pick a point on the sign. I'm not going to continue that same workflow, but also for trees, we have a more um, automatic workflow where I don't need to click on each trunk of the trees. Instead, I can just choose the automatic uh, method and then extract all the trees. By um, going through this route, um, TBC will, of course, also get all the coordinates or the positions of the trees and also map out the tree spread, the trunk diameter, and the tree height information uh, accordingly, as long as I choose a proper feature code to start with. Um, so in this case, I will show you the final result. If I now restore all. Ooh, what it's trying to do now. Oops. <laughs> okay, seems like it's kind of using all my memories. But now I have all the uh, uh, the whole project showing up. 
and I can show you the final results by turning off all the point clouds. Probably I need to close it and then reopen it. Sorry about that. You've now had a successful software demo, right? No good demo is complete without <laughs> software crash. Yeah, it always happens when I demo it. We are running a little long. Right. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, the uh, rail show this this last little bit, and then we'll get into some quick best practices, um, and then and then um, move on. So if, uh, if you're unable to attend with us past the hour, thank you. Um, this recording will be available, but stick with us here. We're getting to get some good tips uh, coming up here um, very shortly. Yeah. Um, so I will go a little bit quick from now. Uh, I already predefined some different view filter managers. So you can see that uh, in this whole project, I uh, run through the tree extractions and the pose and sign extractions so that we now have all these features ready to be exported into a GIS platform or into a, a CAD platform. And besides uh, the um, feature extraction, we can also do some line works based on uh, the point cloud. So for example, here, if I still show you the um, extracted ground regions, um, usually in a lot of cases, uh, the field workers need to extract all these uh, pavement markings so that they know what the road looks like as built. And here we can kind of do the same thing. We can create all the um, line works based on the point cloud. And if you want to, you can also change the line style so you can see the dash lines and the double yellow lines accordingly. Also, since we now have a very smooth uh, ground region to start with, if I want to extract the terrain information, for example, create a surface on top of the point cloud, we can do so as well. Instead of using millions of points in the ground regions, I created a downsampled uh, point cloud, which is still having a one foot uh, uh, interval in between points. Based on this one, I can easily create a surface to represent the existing road. Here is the road surface we can create on top of the ground, uh, ground region point cloud. With this, uh, you can start to design a new corridor if you want to and compare that result with your existing road and to understand which area need to be cut or fill with how many materials. So if I quickly turn on the road surface for the um, for the corridor and open the corridor cross-section view. Hey, Ray, um, I'm curious, just approximately, um, the automatic extraction of those all those trees on the site, approximately mm -hmm. how long do you, did that take you? Was it like, eight hours and you just cleaned it up real nice and pretty for us for this demo or an hour or how long did that take? Um, so for all the trees, it took about 30 minutes. And that's yeah. it. Oh. Yeah, for okay. pose and signs, since they are semi-automatic, uh, it took also about half an hour for me for each type. Um, so uh, along, the, along these roads. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And here we can now check the uh, corridor design uh, and compare it with the existing uh, road surface or the ground. You can see some areas we need to cut the whole area or fill the area. But overall, the new design seems to be 
fitting into this area quite well. If I'm happy with this design, I can now start to um, generate the cross-section sheet views to guide my um, uh, field crews in their field jobs. So I already pre-imported uh, a plan set into my project. Uh, how do you do that is to go through the drafting uh, no, uh, tab and open the drafting templates uh, folder. Here, Trimble already provides a lot of existing templates for you. The one I'm using is the Feet Arc D Plan Set Landscape VCL. Simply drag and drop it in, then you can edit each individual sheet definitions um, uh, later. So in this case, I already uh, defined some cross-section view um, definition. And if you are uh, going to change the colors of these uh, labels or change how the uh, surfaces will be colored or uh, how dense you want to have in each uh, sheet view, you can always change those parameters in the editing uh, window. But uh, right now, I will just show you the final result by build sheets. Oh, actually, wait a second. I want to change the view filter manager first. There we go. And then build sheets. We have three sheets created. I can now open one of them to show you the final result. We have all these stations listed and at each station we have the design surface and the original surface. And here it also shows me how much area we need to cut and fill. And at the bottom for the title block area, you can add your own company logo, um, uh, legends and uh, some survey description notes and also other metadata information. Besides the cross-section view, you can also deliver all the uh, features we just extracted in the nice plan and profile sheet view. Same thing here, I have already edited this sheet view, so I'm going to just oh, change the view filter manager. Feature view. Oh, actually, it should be the sheet uh, plan view. There we go. I'll remove these. View the sheets. Now, not only we have the profile view for the corridor at the bottom, we also have the uh, plan view sitting on top uh, where we can see both the existing ground surface, the corridor surfaces, and all the trees and the poles and signs we extracted from, the, from this project. And uh, we have some other um, turning point at the end of this corridor design, so you can see how PVC can easily separate them into individual boxes and to show you more details. I think that's about uh, it. Um, so from here, you can easily decide uh, if you want to print out these plottings or drawings or simply ex um, export all these uh, features and line works and corridors into GIS formats, CAD formats, or machine control formats. Um, Joe, if you think that's about it, we can jump to the slide. Yeah, that was fantastic, Ray. And and you can see Ray showed us all the whole way through from you know not just the mobile mapping piece of, of adjustments, but you know where this fits into what you know the the larger functionality of TBC. So that was that was fantastic. Um, we are running um, uh, late here, Ray, so we can go through these quickly. Um, I will sure. preface this by saying um, that Ray and I and the mobile mapping team are working on having these best practices 
put into a document that will be posted on our TVC website. So um, uh, look for that over the next uh, couple of days here and then you know, be able to digest it a little bit uh, uh, at, at your own pace rather than just here in this webinar or in this presentation. Yeah, so uh, when we talk about best practices, it's related to how we set up the system in the field, uh, how we drive the system in the field, as well as how we treat the data set in the office. So in the field, the first and most important thing is, of course, you want to plan your mission ahead of the time. Which area do you want to cover? And how do you plan to cover all the roads with the highest efficiency? You don't want to drive over the same road and again and again. And again. And of course, system check. Uh, you want to make sure the system is mounted safely on your car and it's still operating. And also the most important thing to get good quality data is to always start your mission in the open sky environment and follow the best practice in the initialization procedure, uh, which means you want to drive some figure eight driving and then wait at some open sky area for two to three minutes to stabilize the whole system. During the run or during the mission, we always recommend you to split the runs for a super long corridor structure. Um, for example, uh, 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 hundreds of kilometers long project, you definitely want to split them into uh, smaller runs uh, for better de data management. But at the same time, if you are kind of uh, working on a intersection area like this, a lot of users may just turn, turn around um, and keep the run going on. But actually, we recommend you to split them into separate lanes so that you can do the run-to-run -run registration like I did in the demo today uh, easier in TBC later. When you are shutting down the whole system, uh, it's always good to uh, do another figure eight driving and another two, three minutes stabilization so that uh, the MX-9 can continue uh, collecting the good GNSS and IMU information. Then stop the mission uh, in the TMI software before you shut down the whole system. As for the ground control points, like Joe said, this is quite tricky because all the environments you're working on uh, are different. And also uh, different companies or different organizations may have different uh, project requirements to work with. But the rule of thumb here will be fill the gap whenever you feel the environment is not GNSS friendly enough. Uh, for these poor GNSS coverage area, you want to add a few more ground control points or checkpoints as needed. And also here, uh, you can see we want to have some overlap in between the runs if you are covering the same area uh, multiple times so that the run-to-run -run registration can be done by adding a few more tie points in the overlap area. As for the target pipes, we suggested um, usually in TBC, these uh, two by two uh, chessboard kind of targets uh, works better than uh, just the reflective targets because it, TBC is using the center point of these targets to do the registration. And if you cannot see the center quite well, it might be tricky for TBC to give you a reliable result. And targets should be big enough to start with so that even if you're driving kind of fast, um, you should still be able to see some, uh, some returns from these targets. And uh, you always want to um, put the targets kind of um, rotated from your driving direction so that you will get better chance to hit all the targets uh, uh, area. Some examples of the target returns in TBC. Uh, the chessboard, as you can see, will always give you some uh, indication of where that center point should be. It's easier to guess. And for these kind of crossing targets, it's also kind of working, but you may need some educated guess to see where the center is. And for the um, 
pure reflective targets. Um, if you are a Trident user, you may find this targets um, very, very well working. But in TBC, since today we are just working on the center point registration, uh, it might be harder to work with this kind of targets. Ray, those screenshots of the return, those are from TBC using the MX9? Correct. Yeah. Cool. And uh, yeah, uh, as for the dimensions, uh, this target, this actual target is uh, 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter uh, big. And these reflective ones are about 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter, just to give you an uh, idea uh, what kind of target size we're talking about. Some bad examples of not working GCPs. Um, I know um, maybe a lot of you are working in surveying uh, environments and you get uh, very used to having very good controls by uh, putting down some survey nails. But unfortunately, in this case, MX9 cannot see these targets in the point cloud. Therefore, they are not uh, working GCP examples. Uh, we do not want to use those as our ground controls. And also in the software, there are a few more other things to think about um, to uh, have a success, successful project deliver, delivered. First, the thing first is, do you want to have multiple missions in one PVC project? Um, you can think about uh, how you are going to use these uh, data sets later. And if you want to have multiple missions in one project, uh, we recommend you to import all those missions before any scans or point clouds are generated on top of them. Because once you generate the point clouds on the missions, um, TVC will only be able to bring back um, or merge all the uh, typical points or lines from these projects, but not the, the point cloud. Um, and another thing is the projection, like you said, uh, like you saw in my demo, we always want to define the proper coordinate system at the very beginning, um, so that we can uh, skip, uh, we can we can eliminate some unnecessary computing time afterwards. Once the point cloud is generated, um, it will it will take much longer to reproject everything to the proper location. And as for the registration workflow, if you have multiple runs covering the same area, uh, the best practice would be get one good run first uh, using type ground control points, then add some type points based on this good reference run, and then register other runs using the type points and the same ground control points if they are available. And to uh, better manage the data size, uh, if you are confident that you are happy with the registration result, you can delete all the original or old scans as needed so that the, uh, you don't see too many scans uh, sitting in one project. I think that's about it. Joe, I will pass it back to you. Thanks, Ray. Um, I've been a part of a lot of these uh, power hours, and I don't, I don't, don't know. Maybe top three, maybe the top one that I've ever been a part of, Ray. That that was an outstanding demo. Um, really, the whole the whole thing. So, um, really excellent work. Um, if you're excited or want to know more, um, like I do, and I hope you do, um, we've got a lot of resources available for you. Um, so we've got Ray back on the YouTube channel to talk about these workflows um, specifically with MX9 in TVC. There's a, a playlist of uh, mobile mapping MX9 that uh, you break down um, these uh, individual components of what Ray showed here today um, a little bit further and just broken up into smaller chunks of video um, for you, uh, as well as 250 other uh, videos on, on the functionalities of TVC. Uh, the web page is a great resource as well. We're adding content and bulletins there all the time. Um, just last night, I posted something on um, what we would recommend as the minimum and recommended configurations for PC hardware if you're going to undertake uh, MX9 data processing TBC. The um, bulletins will be also the page where we will document the best practices that Ray just showed. Um, 
clean them up, build them out a little bit more so the document can stand on its own. And you can use that as a reference here as you learn more, as you process your own MX9 data in TBC. And that is trimble.com slash TBC as the website URL. And then the Power Hour archives. Um, we've been doing this since the middle of 2015, so we've got quite the repertoire of, um, of recordings for you. They're available on demand and free. Um, some of the best Power Hours to this day are a couple of years old, and we're talking about how the computation engine works or how the network adjustment routine works. And then here lately, since the release of the SX10 and and mobile mapping systems and support in TBC, and get more into cloud-based workflows, more focused on field to finish, uh, like Ray talked about here. Uh, you can sign up and, and um, uh, view those recordings at your leisure uh, on demand for free. The community page is building out as well as a user forum that is um, uh, monitored from time to time by the TBC team and the Trimble team as well. But we're really trying to create uh, users interacting with users here on the community page. Uh, that's taken off here nicely. We do do a tip of the week for TBC, a little nugget um, of something that maybe you wouldn't know that TBC did or something that could be kind of handy buried in TBC. Um, TBC's got a lot of functionality now, trying to just make it accessible. It's not as big as in, and as scary uh, as, uh, as it may appear, just trying to make it more accessible to, uh, to our user base. And then next steps, um, we have a, a worldwide um, uh, distribution channel that uh, will probably help you out and, and serve you um, on, a, on a local level. They're in your community, as you can see here. Um, you can download TBC for free from our website um, and then get a free 30-day demo license, including the mobile mapping functionality from that distribution partner. Um, if you're from the geospatial channel, You've got the locator there. If you're from the site tech or construction channel, um, you can um, uh, find your dealer there as well. Um, something to note here is that TBC has merged from the G uh, TBC Geospatial Edition and the Business Center Heavy Civil Edition that was offered by that construction channel. We are now just a single software, um, gained a lot of efficiencies there. Uh, served by two separate channels. So um, geospatial or construction partner, whoever you're used to um, uh, dealing with in your neighborhood, uh, check them out there for more help. And then the teaser, uh, Ray had a very nice uh, fluid uh, uh, mention of this in her, her workflow. Uh, the next Power Hour will be um, four weeks from today on March 27th. Um, our buddy Ben, um, we'll be talking about cutting plane and extraction workflows in TBC. I think he was going back and forth as to whether or not to show um, a, a kind of a corridor-based project or something. Um, he's doing some really cool things with the cutting planes in, inside of buildings there, like you can see. Um, he's, uh, he's got some pretty cool workflows to demo and show. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us for that session as well. And so with that, there's a couple of questions here that we didn't get uh, get a chance to. Thanks for sticking around. Um, we will get you uh, uh, offline and everything is logged. Uh, Ray, again, thank you. Great job. And uh, any closing words of uh, advice or wisdom, Ray? Um, no, not really. Just uh, uh, keep trying the MX9 in TBC. And there are so many other things in TBC. I don't have time to show you today, but uh, it's definitely a great solution um, instead of a single piece of nice hardware. So um, if you have any questions about the MX9 workflow, let Joe know, let me know, and we're always happy to help you. Great. Thank you, Ray. And we will see you all in a couple weeks to talk about some more cutting planes. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, everyone.